The only thing Dabney said about me that is untrue is that uh, my wife didn't really uh, underscore the uh, enthusiasm uh, that I have for this job. I'm supposed to be retired and living in Sarasota, Florida, playing with our four grandchildren. And some of you have heard me tell, uh, about two weeks after I had agreed to do this job for a short period of time, which has now turned into a long period of time, I was shaving. We were getting ready to go to church on Sunday morning, and Gwen had this sort of, it's not going too far to say, almost uncontrollable laughter. And I said, what in the world is wrong with you? What are you thinking about? She said, I cannot believe you are the president of a seminary. <laughs> well, I've enjoyed it in many ways. They've been uh, some of the most enjoyable, uh, I guess I can say years, certainly 18 months that I've had in my career. And one of the things I'll try to do tonight is to show you some of the things the seminary maybe has in common with some of the problems you face in various dioceses or in local parishes. And probably one thing that we all have in common is on some days I really do think when I'm tired, I really wish life could be the way it used to be. And if you lived in the seminary world, the way life used to be, it was a really romantic kind of existence. It was a model that served the Episcopal Church very well. It was a three-year residential MDiv program that was presided over usually by a man who was a priest, who did get to know all the students. He was a learned dean. He taught. He counseled students. Several of my predecessors have told me they got to know every single student who came through Seabury Western, and that was one of the joys of their deanship. Students were different then, too. Students basically came right from college, and they spent three years in residence. They went to chapel several times a week, some several times a day, and that's what we came to know as spiritual formation in the Episcopal Church. And the faculty was a delight. It's unusual to hear a former college president say that, but the <laughs> faculty was a delight. But they operated on the old research model of a university. We had New Testament professors, Old Testament professors, ethics professors, people who taught systematic theology, Anglican studies. They taught, they knew students, they helped form students, they did their research, they published books that we read, and they were involved in the tenure system. So that after six years, if they had done their work well and the faculty and the board had voted on them, they had their jobs. Uh, for life, and that was a good thing. Well, times have changed. That was the old model of seminary education. And our community has changed just like some of the communities that you live in. We have fewer students today than we had 20 or 30 years ago. When we were at Canuga just a couple of weeks ago, we took a survey of the bishops there and discovered that we really only have about 400 people in seminaries studying for the priesthood. We have 11 seminaries. If we divided those students up evenly, we couldn't all survive. And some of those 400 students are in university-based schools or non-denominational schools. Many, many, many of the students, and you know this, who are coming to seminary these days are not like students 30 years ago. They're older students. They're not able to leave their jobs. They're not able to leave their families for three years. And so we have fewer students. And so we, like some of your parishes, we had empty rooms. Our costs would go up. We began to defer maintenance. And some of what Dabney was talking about with parishes some of our most significant physical assets were deteriorating. And so if you had a job like I did after uh, first retiring from the president to DePaul and you were on the, the board of trustees of a seminary, you found yourself spending most of your meetings talking about how we're going to deal with this. And we talked about it in our place so much that one could really look back and say, well, were we really talking about the mission of the place at all? And we, like many of you, faced tough choices. We could keep on going as we had done before, 
And we knew at Seabury, if we kept going the way we had gone before, we would die. I don't mean we would gradually wither. I mean, we would die. We had an $8 million endowment. We had a line of credit used up at the bank of $4 million. We had fewer students every year. We could either die or recreate ourselves. And so I came all the way out here on an airplane to tell you a good news story, but it did not start that way. Some of the things we've created or recreated have really come at a great cost to us. And so I want to say that at, at the beginning. I don't want people to hear me as some speakers I've heard in the past that this person came in to tell this wonderfully romantic story about how everything we did worked. It came at a great cost. We're excited, and you'll hear the good news at the end of my talk. We're excited about what we've become, but it was not easy. We had to have a radical, we went through a radical change in the way we did business. It was about the worst thing that could ever happen to a college or a university or a seminary. We did what in the educational world is known as we declared bankruptcy. We declared financial exigency. What that means, if you're not familiar with the educational community, although I think most of you are, that means you're not gonna have enough money to pay to pay your faculty. You're gonna go out of business unless something happens. And you can't just say that as a way uh, to dismiss tenured faculty people. You have to have a third party expert come in and say, yeah, I've examined the books. They really, it's really that bad. It's really that bad. And so we did that. And the first thing we encountered was uh, when we declared financial exigency, everybody thought we were dead. Probably some of the people in this room thought we were dead. People thought Seabury has closed. It is out of the three-year residential MDiv business. We had bishops who refused to let their students continue with us because we were going out of the three-year residential business. There was a lot of anger. I thought being on a seminary board would be really a lot of fun in a way to live out some of our commitment to the Episcopal Church. I thought when I left DePauw that I would never have to face angry students or angry alumni again. And I was very, very wrong because there was a lot of anger at the decision we made. Alumni said, you know, it's not the school I remembered. I'll never give you another penny. Some of our Episcopal colleagues thought if it's not a three-year residential program. It's not a really a seminary of the Episcopal Church. Students were mad. People I didn't even know were mad at me because they had come to school thinking it was going to be one way and we saw we couldn't go forward. So it was really hard. We lost a lot of good faculty. These people were our friends. You know, so I wouldn't stand before you as a former president and say, you know, one of the things we did was to dismiss all our tenured faculty that was a painful experience to go through. It was at, at great cost. It was a real grieving process. But now, the good news. In retrospect, we were guilty, we trustees, and maybe the faculty and the students. If we were guilty of anything, it was because our dreams were far too modest. And we were more wed to the status quo than we should have been. We were geared, we organized our whole lives together so we could survive the way we had always been. And it was exactly as Dabney said in his opening remarks, we were focusing on all the wrong questions. And I can look back now and see that we were really called to be more creative. We were not courageous. We did what we had to do. And uh, we have to remind ourselves of that because we are so pleased with where we are. We look back and say, you know, weren't we courageous? No, we weren't courageous. We were scared to death. But, and some of you have heard me tell just this little snippet of a story before, we were called to be more creative. And one of the things we learned from the business community, I'm an avid reader of the Harvard Business Review. And I'm an avid learner of what the business community has to teach the church. And when you subscribe to the Harvard Business Review or resubscribe, they send you the, some of the best articles 
most popular articles they've ever had published, and one was uh, 40 years old called Marketing Myopia by Thomas Levitt. And it's a story of the railroads and how they lost their business to trucks, to airplanes. And what Levitt says is the railroads never understood they weren't in the railroad business. They were in the transportation business. And that's a big difference. So as we look at the futures of our institutions, we have to think, what business are we really in? What is our purpose here? One of the mistakes the railroads made, they thought there was no substitute for their product. A lot of us in the seminary world have thought there was no substitute for our product. You will come spend three years in residence in a seminary, and that's the way you get to be a priest. In fact, that's the only way. But the world is teaching us, the church is teaching us a little different. There are over 300 people in local training programs, as opposed to the 400 who are in our seminaries. There are a lot more in university-based schools. One of the mistakes I think some parishes have is they think, you know, I love the Episcopal Church. But some of us think that there's no substitute for what we have to offer. I tell you, young people are finding substitutes. They're in yoga classes. They're in Buddhist classes. They're playing soccer on Sunday morning. And the fastest growing group in the American population are those people who have no affinity with any denomination or any religious cause at all. I mean, we have some big problems to face. And we have to grapple with what business are we in? What purpose do we serve? And we define that differently in terms of theological education. What would be our new story? Two years ago, we really didn't know. But we sold our property. It was the only asset we had. We sold all our property to Northwestern. Those were some of the most uh, agonizing discussions I was in because uh, it was good business. I mean, we were out to get every penny we could. And we thought they were the only buyer we had. And the only thing we had in common, we became good friends. I told Gene Sunshine, who's the charge of the business office at Northwestern, the only thing we had in common is we each thought we had the other one over a barrel. They needed our property, and they thought they were the only buyer for our property. Well, we worked it out, though, and we went from being $4 million in debt to having, when all the payments from Northwestern come, we'll have over $20 million in endowment. And we had the opportunity to say, well, now how can we use, you know, it was a lot more fun instead of saying, how can we get rid of that $4 million debt? It was a lot more fun to say, if you had $20 million and wanted to serve the Episcopal Church, what would you do? Well, it wasn't rocket science. We asked a lot of people. We had to spend the first 18 months talking to a lot of bishops, talking to a lot of cardinal rectors, beginning to raise questions about, well, what could theological education really be about? It's the same question you say, when, what could be the mission of this parish? Why is quality theological education reserved only for clergy? Why don't we use full-time seminary faculty in education of lay people? Who in the seminaries are really taking the role of priest as teacher very seriously? And are there partnerships we could form? We formed one. We're, we're going to be the only two schools. We're going to the Lilly Endowment to talk about this. We've been invited. Um, Dad and Mitch and Bexley Hall, the two smallest seminaries in the Episcopal Church, one in Columbus, Ohio, one in uh, Evanston. We are pulling together, not in a merger. Merger's, out, merger's a bad word. Somebody loses, don't they? You know, somebody takes somebody over. We have a kind of, people don't know what this is. The, the professionals call it a federation. We, we call it a cooperative venture. Where we're gonna have one president for both institutions. Some would argue you don't even need one president. We sure don't need two. One development office. One communications office and one board of trustees for the two institutions. We're going to keep doing the kinds of things that we've been doing. Bexley Hall with Trinity Lutheran offering an MDiv program and a model that we can afford. We put our faculties together and we save about $150,000 a year that we can put into program. And uh, so we will have together the MDiv program with the Trinity Lutheran. 
We're exploring with several bishops across Providence Five, working with the diocesan training programs so that we have full-time seminary faculty teaching in those programs. We still have the DMIN degree and the Anglican Studies program. What I'm trying to say, how freed up we are for ministry as a result of getting rid of our property. And we've identified some strengths, we've identified some new publics. Who will our new students be? We want to teach theology. We want to be in the theological education business. But unlike the railroads, we don't want to define it narrowly. We've identified new publics. We've identified those people who are in local training programs. We've identified as a result of some of the conversations we had the bishops at Canuga, uh, the need to teach some courses like many of you never had in seminary. So we have an alliance with the Kellogg School of Management and we're talking about marketing for nonprofits and how you can use technology to communicate with so many of those folks who are not uh, involved with the church. We're talking about a joint venture with Auburn in terms of theological education for lay people. And we're talking about pedagogy. I can tell you as a lay person, uh, Gwen and I have been privileged to be in several churches. We've never been in a parish we didn't like. That's the honest to God truth. And we've never been in one that had a really good education program for adults. And so we have to wonder if theological education has done a good job in training priests to also exercise their teaching ministry. And maybe there's a niche for us there. So now we look to the future. We do it with confidence. We do it with resources. We can look back and say, you know what we learned through this whole process? We learned that we were organized to prepare priests for a world that didn't exist. And we had faculty teaching in a different kind of way. Now we have a new kind of faculty. Uh, we teach our courses not in the seminary buildings. As a matter of fact, we're going to move. We've made a better deal. Uh, we think it's in the works, so we don't pay the rent. We pay to Northwestern. It'll be a little less. And we do our teaching in parishes, and we do our teaching on site. We do our teaching not in semester-long things, but in week-long intensives, where if you want to take one of our courses as a lay person or a clergy person, continuing education or not, anybody can take any of our courses. And you would do it where you would do your readings ahead of time. You would come spend a week with us or a weekend with us, and then you go back home. And what that means, because we're not geared to being in one place, is our faculty can live any place. We hired Diana Butler Bass. We hired Bill Sachs. They both live in Washington. We uh, got one of our friendly trustees to underwrite the Trabai fellows, and so they come. Uh, we have faculty meetings every month just talking about what we can do for the Episcopal Church, and they fly in from Washington, spend the night, we talk the next day. They teach in these modules. It is nimble. We will not ever have tenure again. I'm not an opponent of tenure. I just don't know that we can make it work in all of our schools. It's not about academic freedom. We absolutely believe in academic freedom, but we have to be flexible. So we have a new place and a new way to teach, different ways to use technology so that we may be able to serve the educational program needs of the local parish in a way we couldn't do before. And we stumbled a little along the way. We had some failures, and I, I won't, just want to mention one to you because it, it's easy to get all bold and adventuresome, and you go out and, and you try your new idea, and it's awful. We had a great idea that we could get lay people involved in the life of the seminary, and what we would do is we'd bring famous people in, and they would give a talk, and people would turn out, and yada, 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 and that worked when I was growing up because we had the politics of the world and the great theologians. People came from all over the world to study with theologians in this country. The theological education has changed a lot and what I call the famous speaker syndrome didn't work very well for us. We had trouble turning people out. We had to say, well, what is it people really want to hear? You read the Eric Aronson book. People still want to talk about what happens to me when I die? How can I experience God? What does faith mean in the workplace? Those basic questions that we don't need to get away from and we can use our own faculty. We don't have to have famous people. And so we sort of failed and we've changed that. And the good thing about using our own people, we don't have to pay these speakers fees. And we're in dialogue with people about what they want to talk about. 
we've begun to recreate ourselves. And one of the best ideas we've had, it's something that, that when you get adventuresome, you ought to try to put this into place because it is something you can duplicate. Uh, one of the things we convinced one of our, our, our trustees to do was, why don't you give us a fund just to let us bring the best thinkers in the church to Seabury once a month just to talk about the future of the Episcopal Church that can cut across a diversity of opinions that can keep us. We want to keep recreating ourselves. One of the problems we had before, we thought we had arrived and we loved who we were for 100 years. And now we've done something exciting. And 20 years from now, we probably ought to be doing something else. And we want to keep that freshness. We don't want to make the same mistakes again. So we have a design for tomorrow. We expect to grow. We expect to be different. All of the bishops in the room, I, I think if you were listening to us at Canuga, you might or might not have liked what we at Bexley Hall and Seabury had to say, but one of the things you took away from it, we're different. We are, are different. John Cotter, who teaches at Harvard in the business school, did a nifty little book you ought to read if you get in the entrepreneurial spirit called Saving Your Good Ideas from Being Shot Down. And one of the things he said that people do and you've all heard it. Well, we've not done it that way before, and that makes me a little nervous. Theological education has not been done the way we're attempting to do it before, and it does make some people nervous. So in drawing this kind of to a conclusion so we have time to talk a little one with another, what have we learned in the last couple of years? One of the things we learned is we've learned to examine our community to gain access to the data. When the seminary deans and presidents got together, we found out we didn't even know how many people were, in, were studying for the priesthood. Well, now we know. And now we know where they are. Uh, we tried to assess the data, tried to assess the needs. We tried to, you know, I said Gwen laughed. I mean, really laughed when her husband became the dean of a seminary. Um, what did I know about it? Uh, last 18 months, we've done a lot of listening. We listened to the bishops in Province 5. We've listened to people all across the church. We've listened to people in our community. We were willing to make some tough decisions. We wrestle every month in faculty meeting with the question, what business are we in? What purpose do we have? And we have moved, this is the good news, we have moved from grieving to excitement. I want to conclude by mentioning not three big points, but just three little snapshots and one learning from contemporary psychology. The summary would go something like this, and it, it really trades off what Dabney was talking about. When I say the most liberating thing we ever did was to sell our property, I don't want you to get me wrong, I love the buildings too. If you've ever been to Seabury Western, you, you know the spire on top of the chapel and the lights that you, you know, I could almost cry looking at that place. I loved it so much. I, I love the parishes we were in. Parish we were in in Bloomington. It was a, after I left the presidency of DePaul, and we could be kind of like normal people. And we, we moved to Bloomington and moved into that parish, and, and it was like some of the churches maybe you represent. And I said it with a smile on my face. That it was not far from Bedford, Indiana, so it's made out of that limestone, and it's dark, and it's musty. It, I, I said to some of my friends, it smells kind of like the Holy Spirit just left. <laughs> but even with all that, you know, we loved that place. We became attached to it because of the ministry that they had. So I'm not against buildings, but now we rent our space. And that's become a liberating thing for us. And so it won't be long, it'll be a matter of weeks, if not months, certainly not years, before I won't be able to go outside at night from the deanery and look up and see that spire and get a kind of a choked up feeling about what a wonderful ministry that God has called us to. But we've traded our real estate assets for new forms of ministry. 
And when I think about using our assets for lay education and for equipping priests, particularly their first two years out and some of the things they didn't learn in seminary, like how to run a business and read a spreadsheet and raise money and all that stuff, I get really excited and I get more enthusiasm telling our story than I do looking up at that spire. We've explored collaborations with Bexley, with Trinity Lutheran, with Auburn. And those are things we learned. Last comment. Uh, I said I was an avid reader of the Harvard Business Review. Their last uh, issue before last was on failure, you know. And I really hope we don't get caught up in thinking that we are failing, but we are called to be in different places. It was on failure. And a psychologist named uh, Martin Sigelman from the University of Pennsylvania has done numerous studies about how people react to adversity. And I tell you, we're in the Episcopal Church. We have plenty of adversity. I mean, we have lost so many members. We are like businesses that are beginning to struggle and answer and ask new questions so we can survive and be meaningful and have a core group. And, and, and Seligman says, people fall three different segments of the spectrum. And he estimates that when faced with real problems, with real adversity, about a third of the people, based on his studies, fall apart. They go into depression. Some of us went into depression when we had to tell our faculty they wouldn't have jobs anymore after another year. Some even commit suicide. That's Sickleman's study. He said, but then in the middle segment is where most people fall. And at first, when you undergo these changes, there's a great deal of depression and anxiety. But within a few months, these people are resilient and they come back. And then there's a smaller segment. What he calls the people on the other end of the post-traumatic growth. They too experienced anxiety and depression. But within a year, they were better off than they were before. Well, he winds up by quoting Nietzsche, the famous statement, that which does not kill us makes us stronger. So just in a fantasy world, if I could recreate theological education and make it the way I wanted it to be, if I had the resources to create a new Episcopal seminary, I'd probably do it the way we're doing it. I wouldn't rush down the street to buy a lot more property. So I said at the beginning, some days I spend my time thinking about, I really wish life was the way it used to be, the seminary that I went to, and dum to dum to dum But most days, in fact, most every day, I welcome the new and the challenge and the excitement. And we have found our niche. I'm not implying that you can emulate everything that we've done, but I hope, as Dabney said, you use these conversations together and you too can find your niche and encouragement. Thank you.